Shalom, praise the Lord, and um, welcome to class. Thank you, Nina John, for, uh, uh, for joining class. And also welcome to our in-person students and to our uh, e-learning students who will be listening to this lecture later on. Um, today is our last class, the last class for this uh, course in this semester. Uh, we have just two more uh, lessons in this book, uh, Kingdom Builders. Okay, So the last two lessons, what have we been uh, discussing about? Before that, uh, we'll pause for a word of prayer and ask Sri Radha to lead us in prayer. Thank you, God, for this time, for this day. And we come before you and we pray and we thank you for this semester. Thank you for Pastor Selena that he she led us... Uh, she uh, taught us this whole course and uh, we submit all the students into your hand god and whatever we will discuss about this course you just guide us lead us bless us in jesus name we pray amen amen thank you sri radha so in the last two lessons what have we been discussing about the last two lessons last two chapters what have we been discussing about? Uh, chapter 7 about partnership, co -worker, being co-workers in the kingdom of God. Okay, it is basically we have been discussing about how in kingdom building we need to partner with each other and we need to co-work with each other okay so we saw how it is uh, important for us to partner and also as, as, in the, as ministers as leaders as pastors and uh, also how important it is for the local churches to come together in unity and oneness the pastors and the leaders the local churches to come together uh, to partner with the others uh, other pastors and other leaders in the city uh, for city transformation okay on the same lines we're going to talk about another area where how we can uh, partner together in building uh, the kingdom of god basically about how we can be mentors okay how we can mentor each other how we can be uh, brothers and fathers uh, sisters and mothers uh, for each other in the kingdom of god okay we began looking at this chapter um, last class okay in in the new testament who is the greatest example we can we can see two examples we have two great examples of how they were um, shepherding the flock or uh, you know uh, mentoring and who are those two people paul and paul uh, okay paul fathered timothy okay mentored timothy and who else was a good shepherd another example Jesus, yes, Jesus himself was, you know, set the model on how important it is to raise up, um, you know, disciples, to raise up people who he mentored so that they could continue the work after he left. Who are the ones who continued the work after Jesus came and initiated the kingdom here on earth? His disciples, right? And the disciples, what did they do? They passed it on to others okay so so important for us to pass on uh, the revelations the truths the spiritual legacies that we have received to the next generation and how do we do that one way is through mentoring okay discipling mentoring okay being uh, fathers and brothers uh, and being um, sisters and mothers in the house of um, god okay so when we look at uh, people in the ministry, when they relate to other ministers, how is their relationship with each other? Ministers of God, pastors, when they relate to other pastors, other ministers in the city, how is their relationship with each other? How is their relationship with each other? Okay, to be co-workers, but how is their relation? Okay, how are they, brothers? How are they in their relationship with each other? No, I'm talking about when you look at their relationship in our present day context in our churches. Okay. How is the relationship between ministers and pastors amongst themselves? Okay. They're competing with each other. 
very business like right very professional and it's not more relationship like not relational okay uh, what do they do when they meet they just greet very formal okay they just share information they just share their ideas okay and uh, are, do they come to a place where they're really bonding in close intimacy or friendship with each other where they're sharing their lives sharing their weaknesses sharing their struggles very rare right why do you think it's so rare among ministers and among pastors why do you think it's so rare <clears throat> they don't trust each other okay why don't they trust each other they feel insecure okay please take the mic and speak keep it in the center there so you can yeah they feel a uh, princess they feel insecure uh, so that they uh, you know they will be judged what else Nina, please take the mic. We need the online students to also hear. They don't have that much relationship and bonding. No relationship bonding, okay? They fear that their people will go to the other churches if they have that. Uh, yeah. Okay, they have insecurity, okay? Basically, they feel uh, they would feel that you know the pastors would think, oh, he's a man or a woman of God. How can they do this? And they can talk about them to others, gossip about them to others, or mock them or make fun of them. Um, so that can be one, I mean, these are the major concerns that why people don't share their personal weaknesses, their challenges, their difficulties that they um, go through, okay? Uh, but do uh, ministers, pastors go through challenges and difficulties? And what do they do when they go through difficulties and challenges? They pray. <laughs> <laughs> they pray, okay. What do they do? They keep the Nina Santoshes, they keep to themselves, okay. They think somehow it'll just go away, right? They or they get so busy ministering, counseling, taking care of others that they overlook their own personal problems, their own personal challenges, till it blows up like a volcano and you know, it is so evident to others and they come to a place where, you know, there's a breakdown in their own physical health or mental um, health. Okay. So um, why do you think leaders struggle alone? They don't share. They don't, share. They don't want anyone to know. Okay. What else? They feel they'll be judged, okay? So much of pressure. So much of pressure. What pressure? Like if they go and uh, share with fellow congregation, like how they will see them. Okay. And the responsibilities of other things they have to do. Okay. It's basically their responsibility, their calling, their position that really threatens them and stops them from really seeking um, help, okay? Uh, what do you think are some of the challenges that we can face when ministers, one minister and another minister want to get into, uh, you know, uh, be brothers to each other or sisters to each other? What do you think are the personal challenges they can face? What are some of the personal challenges that uh, people face, ministers face when, you know, when they want to be brothers together like this. Okay, this is a good model. Maybe some of you are thinking, hey, this is a good model. I have to be a brother to somebody and I have to find a mentor in somebody. So when I go through problems and difficulties, I will have somebody to fall back on. But what do you think are the challenges? Their ideologies. Their beliefs, doctrines, ideologies. Time consuming. Okay, sometimes, it's time consuming. Yeah, so sometimes people are not read, ready to do that. Okay. And uh, some yeah, a lot of responsibility comes with uh, when you're partnering with somebody, there is a lot of responsibilities also. Yes, there's a lot of responsibilities, right? Uh, like um, Nina said, we need to spend a lot of time. Okay. Now, if two of us are going to be brothers or, you know, sisters or mothers or fathers, then there's a lot of time that needs to be spent. Like, you know, you need to know 
uh, each other, their family, how he treats or she treats his, their spouse, their children, come to the church office, see how they, you know, the church is going, how the how they're, uh, you know, working with their staff. Also, uh, need to spend time in worshipping together, praying with each other, you know, celebrate each other's success uh, and their moments of victory. And in times of uh, difficulties, you have to be there to counsel, advise each other, Okay, um, receive from each other's gifting and anointing, also honor each other. And, uh, you know, sometimes we need to make sacrifices, you know, when they are going through struggles, personal welfare, and their family, we need to, you know, uh, give support them. Also, when people hate them and criticize them, you know, we need to stand in defense for them. So, so many challenges that are there and that is why this whole concept of being a brother to somebody, another brother or being a sister to somebody else, being a father parenting somebody, being a mother parenting, people don't fall into it because of the high level of commitment and responsibility that is um, needed. Okay. Um, but you think, what do you think? Is this a good model to follow? Is this important? To be brothers, fathers, mothers, sisters in the house. Yes, yes. and if you, if you'll get somebody who's really passionate for the Lord and the love is there, it's really a blessing. Otherwise, there are negative things also. Yes, I think uh, you know, as iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens the countenance of the other. You know, I think it's important we learn from each other, just receiving from each other, just learning from each other's lives. You know, uh, if you are mentored by somebody who is like a father or a mother, they can tell you what are the challenges and difficulties they went through, which can help you. Even when you have to, yes, you know, and you can grow fast. You can learn from them. Uh, you can receive from their life, their ministry, their anointing. Um, and it also helps you to also know how to mentor others, how to build um, others. Do you think uh, passing on this revelations and this truths that we've received from one generation to another generation. Do you think it's important? Why? Is it biblical? Yes? No? Why do you say yes? Passing gen I mean, with every generation, mm -hmm. we are getting more of God's revelation okay. compared to 100 years back. Now we know I mean, this generation knows a lot of things about the world. Okay. It's much clearer. Okay. So when we give that to the next generation, they can be all the more grow in the Lord. Yes. And what does God tell in the Old Testament? Teach it to your children's children. You know, he, all these laws and commandments, teach it to your children's children. Don't let it depart from your mouth. Tell it to the next generation, the praiseworthy uh, deeds of God. And when should you teach them? When they're young? And uh, at what time of the day you need to teach them? When they are, when you're lying down with them, when you're walking with them, when you're sitting with them, you know, at all times of the day, impart them, teach them. So passing on spiritual legacy is so biblical, so important, and God wants us to do that. So, you know, being a brother, sister, father, mother is such an important concept that we can all uh, imbibe. Okay. What happens when a brother stumbles and falls? What do we do? We do, do we really help them to get up? <laughs> think that you're a brother to him we, we have to do that okay but what do we do uh, what do we do otherwise otherwise what do we do what are we quick to do huh? okay you see you just sit and uh, the students here are saying they just sit down and have fun and watch them okay you criticize yes what else? You condemn them. Okay. Um, look at what Matthew chapter 7, verse 3 and 5 says. Can somebody please read that? Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 to 5. And read why it. do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Oh, how... Oh, how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye and then you will clearly see, clearly to re see, to remove the speck from your brother's eye. 
Okay, so what do we do? We criticize and mock somebody else's speck, a small dirt weakness, but we can have a big plank in our own eye. Okay, um, what should be our um, attitude when we look at, uh, you know, a man of God, a woman of God, a leader uh, who's fallen in temptation or weakness? What should be our attitude? Please take the mic and speak. No? Yes. We should be compassionate, gracious. Okay. We should not. We should first see ourselves, how we went, how from that place, how God has showed us grace to raise up. OK. Look yeah. at our own sinfulness and see how God has been gracious to us. Be compassionate and gentle and loving towards them. What else? When we look at them, what do we? What should be our attitude? We should be uh, fear that this could have been happened to us also. So we have to be very careful and help the brother to get up. Yes, this could happen to us as well. Okay, so for us to learn, right? For us to learn. When I see men and women, uh, you know, fall into temptation, for me it is, uh, uh, you know, hey, watch yourself. Be on your guard. You know, because this man or woman of God was so, uh, you know, spiritual. Uh, and for them to fall in this area, my gosh, it can be shocking. It can be very saddening. It can break your heart. And you can think how it would have broken God's heart when they would have done this. But for me, the whole thought is, hey, you know, watch your salvation. Guard yourself so you can also fall in this area, okay? Because, the you know, uh, devil is like a lion just roaring around, just wo watch, waiting to devour you, okay? So just watch yourself, be very careful, even in small things. So for me, when I look at, you know, people when they fall, for me, it's like a wake up call, you know, wake up. And, you know, I get all full on guard and I like, you know, look at my own life, see where are the areas where I am, you know, have missed uh, looking at and checking on. And then I say, God, you know, please help me. So it's a good you know, time for us to look at ourselves and to check our own um, lives, okay? So we need to, so what, what else should we do? We need to restore that person, pray for that person, right? Important for us to pray and restore because um, it is so sad when, what if for us as strong believers, we can look at it, we can think of it like this, but what about weak believers? You know, those who are babes in their faith, those who are, uh, uh, you know, still growing in their faith. When they look at men and women of God who who fall or are tempted and they give into their weaknesses, they can lose their own salvation, right? They can also fall into temptation. They can go away from God. That can be an excuse. And Satan can use that as a nice excuse to uh, take them away, okay? And uh, we need to also watch our lives that we don't stumble in those same uh, areas, okay? So, um, okay, and um, look at what it says, light and hate don't mix, okay? Even in when we have, uh, you know, in, in the ministry or in the body of Christ, uh, there's a lot of uh, hatred, bitterness that we can hold against each other, okay? Uh, against leaders, against uh, other ministers of God, saying, hey, this minister came and he took away all my, uh, you know, people from my uh, church, you know, or, um, you know, came in the, in the same area and now many people are going to uh, his church, okay, or her church. So, you know, uh, what does the Bible talk about when, how we live in the light and about hate, okay? Look at 1 John chapter 2, verses 9 to 11. Can somebody read 1 John chapter 2, verses 9 to 11? He who says he is in the light and hates his brother, in, he is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walk in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So sometimes there's uh, people who are in Bible college, who are, uh, you know, in ministry as pastors. What happens? You know, we are ministering to others. We are praying. We are preaching, teaching. We are uh, going for uh, Bible studies leading Bible studies and prayer fellowships and, you know, fasting prayer. And, um, you know, uh, having, uh, doing all this so-called spiritual disciplines or rituals, you know, we can still have hatred towards others. We can still have hatred, enmity, um, bitterness, ill feelings, people in our own 
you know, life group or Bible study group or in our own church or in our own Christian organization or against other ministers of God. And what does the Bible say? If we claim to walk in the light, okay, uh, but hate our brother, we are actually in darkness, right? But actually blinded, okay? So it simply means that carrying hate in our heart is not an option, okay? If we have any hurt, bitterness, uh, envy, jealousy, unforgiveness, uh, we need to ensure that we uh, remove that because that can be a hindrance from God working in our lives, okay? And from our ministry, from progressing, and from us uh, being fruitful in the ministry that God has entrusted to um, us, okay? Even if we have any hurt or bitter feelings, what should we do? If you have hurt or bitter feelings, forgive, okay? Reconcile with that person, okay? Put the past behind, uh, look at what, how we can go ahead, okay? We looked at one example of Paul, and John Mark, right, when they went for the missionary journey, the first missionary journey, how John Mark suddenly told Barnabas and Paul that he doesn't want to continue. And what happens, Paul was very, very upset. He thought maybe he's a lazy guy, he's a slack, he doesn't want to work hard for the kingdom of God. And the second missionary journey, when Barnabas wanted to take uh, uh, John Mark along with him, there was a sharp disagreement between Paul and Barnabas, and they separated ways. But later on, Barna, uh, Paul realized that, hey, John Mark is somebody very uh, passionate for God, for preaching the gospel, for doing work, and then he recognizes him. Okay, so it's important for us to leave the past behind, reconcile, you know, um, and work together uh, uh, so that we can, you know, further in God's kingdom, and there is unity and oneness okay even if the pastor or the uh, fellow believer is not willing to reconcile what do you do what should you do just pray for them yes because you can't change their attitude it's god alone who can uh, do it and and god alone can uh, change them okay so we see that you know um even as we are learning and there's a younger generation that's coming up it's so important for us to teach our younger generation okay uh, for for us to impart into their lives speak over their lives to be brothers fathers mothers sisters you know uh, so that we can when we establish god's kingdom and we're building god's kingdom you know there is a continuity of the work there is no stopping okay what happened to the israelites you know we read i think in 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 joshua judges what happens to the last chapter there was no one to, they, they did not teach their generations, the, the, the following generation, the ways and the laws of the Lord. And they came up a generation that did not know the laws and the ways of God, and they went away from God. Okay? It was so sad because the, the, the previous generation failed to teach the younger generation. Okay? Um, so we need to just go beyond looking at being great preachers, you know, great ministers of God and become true kingdom builders. What, who is a true kingdom builder? Who is a true kingdom builder? Huh? No, uh, how can we be true kingdom builders? Sorry, how can we be? How can we be true kingdom builders? Have a kingdom mindset. What is a kingdom mindset? <laughs> what is a kingdom mindset? Take the mic, please, um, Rin. What is kingdom mindset? How we just talked about uh, seeing others uh, as your brothers and sisters, and then also like um, in the body of Christ. Um, having this kingdom mandate of God's will being done here on earth. Okay. What is the main kingdom culture mindset that we need to have? What should be the main kingdom mentality or the mindset that we should have? In person, uh, online, online students, any answers? What is the main kingdom mindset or the culture that should, we should have? As kingdom builders. Okay. What is the main thing? Main. 
It's not about I, me, myself. It's not about my vision, my function, my ministry, my church, but it is how I can use what God has entrusted to me. The vision is given to me. The calling is given me to build the enhance and build and further the kingdom of God by partnering with others. Okay, that is uh, the main mentality or the mindset that we need to have. Not I, me, myself. Um, um, Anthony says sonship mentality, yes. Um, also that we are sons and daughters, that we're building one kingdom. You're not just building my kingdom. It's not raising up my business, but it is building the kingdom of God, okay? And the other culture that we need to have is a culture of oneness and unity, okay? Jackin says also we have to stand in the gap and pray for our leaders and those who minister to others. Yes, we need to do that, right? Okay, so that was chapter 9. Uh, any questions? Any questions before we move on to the last chapter? No? Okay, we move on to the last chapter then. Uh, raising the next generation for kingdom service. Okay. Now, um, God has given us the ability to reproduce both in the natural and in the physical. Uh, sorry, in the, in the physical and natural and in the spiritual. Okay, in the Garden of Eden, what, how, uh, uh, what did God bless Adam and Eve? He blessed them to? He blessed them and be fruitful and multiply. Yes, procreate, okay, bring offsprings of the same kind, okay. So not only in the natural, but also in the spiritual, uh, we are to reproduce or we are, we are to uh, procreate um, the next generation uh, in, to move in the ways and in the, uh, in the commandments and in the laws of God, okay? So when we talk about reproduce, are we talking about reproducing exactly the same Xerox copies? The same I, same kind? No, we are, we are all different, right? We are all have different functions that we are called to, different gifts, different ministry offices that we are called to. But, you know, a success in ministry is incomplete if we don't raise up successors. Okay, what did Jesus do? When, when he was ministering, he ministered. Yes, he had 12 disciples. And what did he do with them? He taught them when, you know, he, the parables. They said, hey, we didn't understand the parables. What is the meaning? So he gives them the meaning. He teaches them. He tells them that he's going to go away. Where is he going to go? What is he going to do? You know, the, that the Holy Spirit is going to come. And when the Holy Spirit comes, what is he going to do? What is his work? You know, what they need to do when, uh, just before he ascended, that they need to wait in Jerusalem. So he teaches them everything step by step. Okay. In time, he teaches them, he mentors them so that they carry on the work. Okay. We uh, look at, um, um, even Paul, right? Paul, uh, did he work all by himself? No. He had many co-workers, co-laborers, brothers in Christ. He used to call them co-workers, co-laborers, uh, my beloved in Christ, my fellow prisoners. That means he was in prison, but those who were also with him doing the ministry at that time, you know. So he refers to them in so many different ways, you know, his beloved in Christ Jesus, my, my beloved, you know. And every letter he mentions about people and it talks about how he is actually even teaching and mentoring people to carry on the work, okay? And he raised up many young people, like, who the people he raised up? Timothy, Timothy Titus, Onesimus, you know, the runaway slave of Philemon, okay? So um, it's important that we raise up people who continue the work, okay? Uh, very, very important. And like I said, it's so biblical as well. Look at what it says in Isaiah chapter 59, verse 21. Can somebody read that, please? Isaiah 59, 21. Isaiah 59, verse 21. As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them. 
my spirit who is upon you and my words which i have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth nor from the mouth of your descendants nor from the mouth of your descendants descendants says the lord from the from this time and forevermore yes so what does god desire what does god desire what is god's desire here You are for place. his word not to be departed from his people's mouth. Okay, for the word not to be departed from his people's mouth. What else? For the word not to be departed, or the covenant not to be departed. Okay, from people's mouth, and also the generations too come right okay from descendants to descendants so he's saying from one generation to another uh, generation okay so god desires that the anointing and the revelation be passed on from one generation to another generation and then when it's passed on he will add on the fresh anointing the fresh revelation that will empower the next generation to do what he has called them to do in his own time okay so um we look at um you know um what why is is it important for us to pass on the spiritual um legacy okay why is it important for us to pass on the spiritual legacy that we have received the revelations that we have received why is it important for us to pass it on what happens if it's not passed on the next generation will not know okay They'll have to start all over again, okay? And what we have started, where we have reached, will lie in ruins. It will be of no use, okay? What else? Why is it important for us to raise up Timothys? So that the next generation. There'll be the next leaders of the next generation. There'll be the Pauls of tomorrow, right? Yeah, extension of his kingdom. They extend. They, yeah, they will extend the kingdom of God to a, the next higher level. Okay, um, what else? So then we will uh, continue the work that God has put in the present generation. If you are not going to speak in the mic, all the valuable things you are saying is of no use because the online students can't hear. Okay. So that uh, they can continue the work that God has for them for the present generation. Yes. Yeah, so the next generation can continue the work. Okay. Um, does this does it happen? There is is there a continuity that we see in churches of one generation passing it on to the next generation? <laughs> ah, can you give the mic, please? They're all having a good time laughing at each other's comments. Yeah, it's actually happening like pastors, pastor sons, pastor grandson. It's happening like that, but no descendants. Okay, it's only happening from the pastor to his son to his grandchildren, okay? And grandchildren's children, okay? And, okay, yeah. Uh, does that happen? Uh, do we pass on the revelations, truth, and the legacy to our next generation? Have you seen it? have to do that but it's not happening we have to do it but it's not happening right if you look at some of our um, sunday schools it's basically it's sometimes very sad because they just basically taught only stories okay but there's no truths there's no they're not given the meat i think nowadays children are quite you know the education system is so uh, way too high for them and uh, they're learning so much we can give them the truths and the revelations from a very young age and i think that is what we are doing at our own children's church so our children's church our children are learning all the courses that you all are learning in bible college okay and the content is pretty high we are, we're teaching them so that when they come out of children's church they're not just given milk and they're waiting for meat but they're also in a place where they've received meat and they're you know willing to take on more revelations more truths and move forward in the kingdom of um, god okay um and the next generation should receive everything that we have 
receipt. Okay. And uh, the high point of one generation should become the starting point of the next generation. Okay. That's why if you look at some of our youth today, some of our um, children today, it's very sad because they don't know the ways of the Lord. They do not know the commands. They do not know his promises because nobody's teaching them. What are they taught in children's church? Just some action songs, David and Goliath, Zacchaeus. Okay. And, uh, and uh, the birth of Jesus and Noah. Okay, and Jonah, all these are famous stories, Adam and Eve, and some of those, even those uh, details they won't know. It's, it's, it's important to narrate stories, but it's important to give them the truths, the deeper truths. Not just narrate a story and say, where was Jonah, how many days he was there, like a quiz. But, you know, give them important revelations. You know, Zacchaeus. You know, why did Jesus go to Zacchaeus' house? Why did he not go to a, a good man's house? Why did he go to Zacchaeus' house? And Zacchaeus, of all people who did not change for so many years, even after people were making fun of him and mocking him and, you know, um, uh, did not want to have a relationship with him, what happened in just those matter of seconds when Jesus did not even give him a lecture or teach him about righteousness or truth or heaven or hell and where he's going to land up with? What was that change? So the very truth that the very presence of Jesus in your life can change you. Such a profound truth. So child can know that it's not about how much you read the Bible or just pray, but it's Jesus living in your heart is what is going to change you. Or receiving Jesus into your heart is what is going to change you. So these can be very simple truths, but these are profound truths that we need to teach children, not just narrate the stories to uh, them or, you know, tell the next generation, you know, need, need to teach the next generation all of these truths. And sadly, our youth don't know much of uh, the theology or the truth in God's word because, you know, we are not taking that initiative to um, teach them. Okay. So let's look at uh, the uh, the life of um, um Paul and see how he raised up Timothy. We learn some precious lessons from how we can be mentors, how we can raise uh, Timothys. Okay. The first one is we need to re recognize a divine connection. Okay. Look at what it says in Acts chapter 16, verses 1 to 3. Can somebody read that, please? Chapter 16, verse 1 to 3. Then he came to Derbe and Lystra. And behold, a certain disciple uh, was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed that his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to have him go on with him. And he took him, uh, circumcised him uh, because of the Jews who were in that region. For they all knew that his father was Greek. Okay, so here Paul goes to Derby and Lystra, and there he meets whom? Timothy. Okay, now did Timothy want to go with Paul? Did Timothy force and say, Hey, Paul, you're a great man, a great apostle, I want to learn from you. Can I be your follower? No, what does it say? Paul wanted him to, yes, to go on with him. So, do you think this, Timothy was the only young person or a young believer there in Derby and Lystra? No. There were many others, but Paul took interest only in Timothy. Why do you think he took interest only in Timothy? Because other people have spoken very well spoken of him. Spoken well of him, okay. Do you think others also would have been spoken well of? I think there was a divine connection, right? He must have just sensed in his spirit that God is telling him, you know, take this man on. You know, take hold of him, mentor him. He's going to, I'm going to use him mightily. And we know that, you know, whatever Paul did, you know, uh, he did it by the leading of the Holy uh, Spirit. Okay, he, he, he writes that in his um, letters. So we need to be sensitive to divine connections. Remember, we said God will send people into your ministry or vision. We need to be sensitive what God wants us to do with them. Okay, whether he wants to uh, mentor them, build them up like Timothy's, we being Paul, you know. Um, so, you know, we need to build up their 
future. And so we see Paul taking the initiative to build up Timothy's future. And he also took Timothy alongside with him all, everywhere that he went. So if you look at um, the, the list of references that are given here in Acts chapter 17, verses 14 to 15, Acts 18, 5, Acts 21 to 4, uh, we see that, you know, Paul, uh, Timothy goes along with Paul, but even if Paul goes to a new place, you know, and he needs Timothy's help or Silas's help, he sends word and they immediately go and help. Uh, Paul. Okay, so we need to select our Paul's uh, Timothy's very, very carefully. Okay, uh, and we need the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Okay, and um, look at what uh, Paul tells about Timothy in um, you know um, uh, talks about Timothy to the church at Philippi in Philippians chapter two, verse twenty-two. Can somebody read that? Can somebody read that, please? Philippians two twenty two. Philippians two twenty two. But you know this, proven, but you know his proven character, that as a son with his father he served with me in the gospel. Yes, and so you see that even uh, Timothy, Paul made a right choice in choosing Timothy. Okay, and also we see that you know it's important that we choose people who are faithful. Okay, not just spoken well of in terms of ability, but also faithful. Look at what uh, Paul uh, writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. Can somebody read that? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So, yeah, we need to, you know... Um, uh, choose people who are faithful and look at the condition of a person's heart more than their gifts or their abilities or talents. Okay. The second thing that Paul did with Timothy was he developed a nurturing relationship. Okay. How does um, uh, Paul refer to as Timothy? His son. Okay. Beloved son. Look at what it says. First Timothy 1 2. He says, True son in the faith. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2, he says, a beloved son. And 1 Corinthians 4, verse 17, he's saying, I'm sending you Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord. So even as Paul considered Timothy as his spiritual son, you know, we see that Timothy was also open to Paul being his spiritual father. And why did Timothy progress in his spiritual or uh, become spiritual mature? Because he was willing to accept Paul as his father, to be mentored. He imbibed his ways. He saw his life very closely, his teaching, his doctrines. And that is how he was willing to learn. So even as we choose our Timothys, we need to choose people who are teachable. What else? Faithful. Paul of God. Humility is very, very important, right? Okay. And we also have to nurture a good relationship with them. Okay. And we also see that, you know, uh, Paul, uh, when he was mentoring people, uh, what really stood out was his life, his testimony and his ministry. Okay. And his, his uh, children in the faith, his spiritual sons, you know, were able to see his life and ministry in a very close way because he was very close. He was very close with them and very transparent in everything that he did, his culture, his lifestyle, the way he lived, the way he did his um, ministry. OK, look at what he writes to uh, Timothy in his last days, just before his death in prison, uh, when he's writing from Rome. Look at what he says in Second Timothy, chapter three, verse 10 and 11. Can somebody read that, please? Uh, but you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflica afflications, which happened to me in Antioch, at Iconium, at, at Lystra. What per persecutions I endured, endured. What and out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Yes. So he's. What is he writing to Timothy? He's saying, I know, Timothy, I've left you in a very difficult 
uh, position in the churches in Ephesus. You know, Ephesus is a big city, a lot of churches and churches around Ephesus city, which Paul, as a young person, had to look after, mentor those leaders, choose leaders, you know, build up the church. And Paul knew he left him in a very difficult place, but he knew he was the right person uh, for that place and that time. And he's encouraging Timothy and says, hey, Timothy, you've seen my life okay everything the way that i've lived my manner of life my doctrine my purpose my suffering my patience my love the persecutions afflictions and what is he telling him he's saying hey you'll go through all of these things but you know be strong endure persevere just like i have persevered okay so another example uh, another thing that we can learn from paul is paul just not does not just leave mentor people and put them into responsibilities but also writes to them, encourages them, and also they have learned by looking at Paul's ways of life and the way that he has lived, okay? The next one is communicate specific instructions. We see that, uh, you know, Paul instructs Timothy what he should be doing, what he should not be doing when he writes his letter in First Timothy and Second Timothy, a lot of instructions he gives him. Okay, you know how he needs to live, how he needs to be a leader, set an example of leadership as a young person, how he needs to choose uh, deacons and bishops and how he needs to take care of the church, how he needs to teach the right doctrines, various things he writes very elaborately and uh, very in a very elaborate way. And he's teaching uh, Timothy. Okay, he's uh, guiding him. He's encouraging uh, him. The fifth one is we need to guide, encourage, exhort and correct okay so he tells timothy in first timothy chapter 6 verse 12 can somebody read that please first timothy chapter 6 verse 12 by the good fight of faith lay hold on eternal life to which you are also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses yes so you know the toughest thing in ministry is what Correcting people, right? Very, very difficult to bring in correction, to teach them. Uh, but should we bring correction or overlook it? Because it's going to, why should we do it? Why should we do it? Yes, the very thing that we neglect and overlook and not correct can become a stumbling block for them okay so you know the very thing that we can neglect can become like cancer that can destroy their own lives okay so when we correct them it's mentioned here that's like a spiritual surgery when you go through surgery there is scars right there is pain that you go through but after those pain and everything what happens to your body your body heals and is restored okay and you come to good health okay there is a positive outcome that happens so also when you correct people you know go ahead and correct them so that there is a positive outcome so that you know they grow and they mature and their lives are not destroyed okay uh we just have two minutes before the break i was just thinking if you want me to finish this chapter and then you know we just end the class and go or do you want to go for a break and then come back okay the in-person students are saying they want to finish class because just few more uh, pages what about the um, online students are you okay can i have some response can we just finish these uh, few more pages in this chapter and then okay thank you chira what about the others okay thank you jacqueline thank you samuel thank you nina yes okay the next one in sixth one is clarify the cost so we see that, you know, when Paul is writing to Timothy, he's saying, hey, there will be afflictions, there will be persecutions, there will be difficulties, but what should you do? There will be sufferings, okay? You need to endure. So he's telling Timothy, hey, Timothy, I know you're suffering in Ephesus. It's nothing new, look at me. Because as an apostle, I've also been suffering. I've endured, you know, I've persevered. God has given me the strength. He will give you also the strength. That's why he says, fight the good fight. You know, be like a soldier, you know, um, uh, be there on your job doing what God has called you. And the God of peace will give you the grace and the strength to go through everything that you are 
going through okay so when we raise up timothys you know we need to encourage them exhort them correct them we need to nurture a good relationship give them instructions important to guide them also tell them what is the cost of serving god or following god okay the seventh one is place honor build up and treat with respect okay we see that even though timothy was a spiritual son to paul how was his relationship with how was paul's relationship with timothy as a father and a son what how is the relationship with the father and a son with respect okay honor how does a father treat a son with love okay how does he build up a son does he say hey i don't want to teach my son if i teach my son it becomes smarter than me huh i don't want to i don't want to teach my son because tomorrow he can turn around and take away all my property because he knows how to read and write and sign and I, so i won't send him to school no what if the father says i won't teach him how to read and write and speak so tomorrow he won't speak back to me or talk back to me or what if i don't teach him what it means to have authority and move in authority what if i keep him as a servant what do you think does any father do that no the father always wants the son to outgrow him okay to be proud of him they don't treat them as servants they don't put them down they don't you know the son so we see that here also when paul is mentoring timothy he doesn't say hey if timothy you know he's becoming very smart tomorrow people can look at timothy as a leader and not me it can happen as with us when we mentor people you know or god is using timothy more than he's using me what if they look at timothy more as an apostle than me so let me subdue timothy let me not send him let me not give me any, let me not give him any responsibilities let me not talk good about him let let me put him down you know paul never does that okay so the amazing thing is that even after he brings him to a place where he seen timothy grow spiritually mature what happens he no longer refers to timothy as his son then he doesn't say my son in the faith my son in the lord you know my uh, my beloved son what is he how does he refer to timothy yes he talks about him as his fellow worker as a brother as a man of god imagine he could have continued talking about timothy as his son and saying hey timothy this is your place and huh? don't uh, get into my shoes don't outsmart me but he says hey this is a man of god a fellow worker a fellow laborer okay and he recognizes timothy's true worth gifting and anointing and he talks well about him we read in philippians right Philippians two chapter twenty two, uh, uh, Paul says his proven character. Look at what he says in First Timothy six eleven. But you, O man of God, he talks about him as a man of God. Okay, look at what he says about Timothy in Second Corinthians one one. Timothy, our brother, yes, apostle of Jesus, Paul an apostle, but he says Timothy, our brother. Okay. so he talks about him as his brother so you know it's important that we raise up sons and not servants very very important okay some of us can raise people up as servants saying that we're mentoring them and keep them under us because we want them to do what we want them to do and not outsmart us outgrow us okay what will happen if you raise up sons and not dot uh, and uh, servants or servants if you raise up sons they will be there always they will take on your spiritual legacy a son will never leave the father or the home even if he leaves his father and his home what happens yes he will always know where he belongs okay a servant will always look for a better place he will always look for a reward but a son will always work for the father and a son receives an inheritance okay and um, servants commitment can change they can leave you and go another man's house but a son remains firm and committed to the family he knows where he uh, belongs okay even if he leaves the family and goes somewhere else where god has called him he will always remember his 
father. Okay, so we must learn to be not lords and bosses, but we need to be fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters who are mentoring sons and daughters or mentoring brothers and sisters and not being lords and bosses who are mentoring servants. Okay, just um, three more things. Okay, we need to delegate and empower responsibility. We, we saw this, right? You know, Paul, when he knows that Timothy is spiritually mature, he gives him responsibilities. Okay, he trusts him enough to give him responsibilities. And that is why he leaves him in a very, very important strategic place like Ephesus to take care of not only the church at Ephesus, the house churches, but so many other cities, the seven cities around uh, Ephesus that is mentioned in Revelation those cities also, you know, Paul, uh, Timothy had to uh, look after. So when you uh, raise up Timothy's, you know, uh, see their capabilities and giftings, give them responsibilities, empower them and leave them to handle things. And of course, guide them and mentor them and continue to encourage them. Okay. And uh, two more things, recommend them positively. Talk about them well. Yes, maybe if they have been your son or daughter in the faith, a brother or sister, you have mentored them, but don't talk about their weaknesses. Okay, A father and a mother will never talk about their weaknesses of their children publicly to others. Okay, Yes, if there is a need for counseling or need help, they will talk, but they will always, everything what happens in the home is always hush hush. What happens in the home, the parents can say, I'll report to pastor, I will tell pastor, or I will tell your Sunday school teacher, you know, but they will not. Okay, They don't want to put their children uh, down. Okay, So when you talk about your Timothy's uh, or your uh, brothers and sisters, talk about them in a positive uh, way. Okay, And we see Paul recommended Timothy as a co-worker and his co-equal in the ministry. Imagine the humility of Paul uh, to refer to Timothy as a co-equal. You know, that is what we need to do. And it requires humility to do that. Okay. And uh, tenth one is release them into God's calling. Okay. So we see that, you know, when he saw that Timothy was mature enough, responsible enough, he uh, releases him into his calling. He honors him. And um, we see that, you know, I think Paul would have felt proud about himself of how he uh, ministered to, uh, you know, um, uh, or how he raised up Timothy and Titus because he must have been proud, you know, saying, hey, I'm anyway, Paul would have thought in prison, I'm anyway going to die now because death was impending on him. He's writing these letters to Titus and to Philemon, you know, about Onesimus. He's writing uh, to Timothy and he knows he's going to die, but he must have been proud and saying, hey, there are people who are going to continue my work, have seen my life, my doctrine, you know, and they have come to that place where the work is going to be continued. And I think that would have been a great, uh, uh, you know, a great uh, enthusiasm and a joy for uh, Paul, even as he was lonely in the prison. And that's why he says, what is my reward? You know, what is my joy, my crown? He says, As, aren't you people? Okay, so his reward, his joyous crown is the people that he raised up, the people that he uh, spoke into their lives. Okay, so uh, is it always important only when we are young that we mentor people or even when we grow old and have gray hair, you know, we retire from ministry and stay back and not do anything? Yeah, we have more experience so we can mentor more people. So some of you who have gray hair, no, don't think it's time for you to retire. God has no use of you. No, you can still mentor the younger people. You know, uh, be brothers, sisters, fathers, and mothers. Share your wisdom, you know, and also keep your anointing fresh. I don't know if anyone in our class is um, in that old age, the son, but we will all reach there one day. But remember, keep your anointing fresh. You know, keep that uh, fire going, just like Paul was. Uh, keep bearing fruit and depart with grace, okay? It's very important for us to do this. So some of the things that we can keep in mind even as we mentor people, okay? Any questions, the last chapter? I meant, yeah, you can give him the mic. Okay, uh, the question here is, uh, am I mentoring anyone? Yes, I have. Uh, 
uh, I have some um, children's church children, you know, who I keep, parents keep calling me and asking me to talk to them, uh, you know, speak to them, impart into their lives. Um, also mentoring those who are in, uh, I get calls from people who are uh, wanting to launch out into children's ministry or also doing children's ministry and they want help. So I run with them for a certain distance, just help them out and then, yeah. My mentor, uh, I don't have any, I don't have any mentor. Yes, I have the Holy Spirit who has been my mentor from the time I've stepped out into ministry. But I think I just closely just observe uh, Pastor Ashish's life and just, just learn from him, just learn from him, yeah. So he doesn't mentor me, but then I just observe his way of life. And, and there's another man of God who I, sermons I listen to, and I, I can't see him, but just him preaching, teaching his love for God, I can, I just receive and, you know, I learn from their lives, these two lives, and of course the Holy Spirit and Jesus. So anytime I, this one, I go back to who Jesus was, what he would have done, and I, I learn from that, yes. Good question. <laughs> yeah, any questions anyone else has? Okay, if not, uh, we'll end class. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for um, um, joining this course. And I hope this has been a blessing and hope we've learned precious lessons. I've learned so many things. I've relearned so many things, even as I prepared so many things as, uh, that has been reiterated in my own life and ministry. And I enjoy learning again and again because we all need reminders. But good to please take hold of these two books and please read these two books. So it's very important because we need to have this kingdom mindset to be kingdom builders, okay? And um, um, and to build the kingdom of God, okay? Yes, Nina? Oh, we can't hear Nina. Sorry, we can't hear you, Nina. Say something. Yes, you can speak. Yes, please go ahead and speak, Nina. She's uh, muted her mic. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Jackin. Thank you all for joining uh, this course, and I hope it was a blessing. Um, you know, it's important that uh, we learn to... Okay. How do we balance the son and servant? How do we balance son and servant? Uh, we don't raise up um servants so you know we need to raise up uh, sons so when we raise up sons we basically uh, raise them up to be you know to move on to a greater level than we are in uh, and we also are transparent with our life our doctrine our teaching um, our mannerisms um, and you know um uh, speak into their lives, impart into their lives, and um, release them for the call. Oh, we are also servants. Okay. Uh, no, we are not servants. We are sons and daughters of the Most High God. We are good. We are stewards in God's kingdom. Uh, we are not servants. Or servants of God. Oh, that was a term that people just use as servants of God, but uh, but what we basically mean, uh, refer to as is we are sons and daughters of God. I don't think we should say that we are servants of God because of the word servant that has a very uh, improper connotation. Like Paul was an apostle of God, a servant of Christ Jesus. Um, yes, which means Paul is basically saying that uh, when he says a bond servant, Paul refers to himself as a born servant of Jesus Christ, which means he's talking about being a born slave. 
and a slave is free to go from his master after seven years. But if he truly loves his master, his master has treated him well, he wants to stay back with his master, then he willingly makes a choice and says, you know, I want to stay back here with my master and serve him for the rest of my life. And for such servants, they, I think, uh, bond servants, they uh, pierce their ear and they put the, the sun and so they, uh, it, they are like bond servants. So what Paul is basically saying is, is like, a bond, I'm a bond slave. That means I willingly um, have chosen to submit, to surrender fully like a bond slave or a bond servant submits to their master and not is not willing to go away. Um, once they are free. So Paul is saying, hey, I've received freedom in Christ. Um, uh, the truth has set me free, but you know, I'm choosing to be uh, somebody who comes under the lordship, under the, uh, you know, uh, in total submission, total surrender to, uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. So that is what he means by saying born servant or born slave. Did that help, uh, Nina? Okay. Okay, that's a good question. Um, any other questions? Okay, so that we'll end class here. Thank you all and um, have a good uh, uh, Christmas. Enjoy yourself. All our in person students will be going back home. So happy holidays. And for all of you, have a good Christmas season. Um, and uh, God bless you all. And I think I won't be teaching you next semester. Second years, I don't teach you in the next semester, yes. I'll teach you in the in the final year. I'll take Romans for you. Yes. So I'll see you in the final in the, the in the your final year first semester. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nina. Okay, bye everyone. Thank you.